If you would please turn with me in your Bibles to the 87th Psalm this morning. Psalm 87, I'll read all seven verses here. His foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God, Selah. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to them that know me. Behold Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia. This man was born there. And of Zion it shall be said, This and that man was born in her, and the highest himself shall establish her. The Lord shall count when he writeth upon the people that this man was born there, Selah. As well as the singers, as the players on instruments shall be there. All my springs are in there. There's a legend in church history about a Spanish nun named St. Teresa who lived in the 1500s. She was known for her numerous dreams and visions. In one she claimed to have met an angel, and this angel held in its right hand a curtain, and in its left hand a shell full of water. When St. Teresa asked the angel what they were for, he answered that the curtain was to hide heaven, and the water to put out the flames of hell, so that men would choose and praise God for himself rather than simply to escape eternal damnation and win everlasting paradise. Now I, for myself, am rather skeptical about the testimony of medieval mystics, but I think St. Teresa has a point that's well taken here. Many folks today have a concern for their creator that goes no further than what he can do for them, not only now, but also in the life to come. It appears that Christianity in the 21st century is not so different from Christianity in the 16th century when it was dominated by superstition and ignorance. We live in an age when most churches are filled with people who come to be consumers to see what they can get out of God or hypocrites just in case this word is true to avoid hell but instead of worshipers who come because they truly want to learn more about God so they can appreciate who he is in himself and what he's doing in this world through his son. Think about it for a moment. The first words which we say before we start into the Lord's Prayer are hallowed be thy name. That's what we say each week. And before we ask for anything else, before we think of anything else, our thoughts should always be marked by the desire to see God's holiness and the glory of God which that holiness displays. All of our intentions, all of our actions, both here and beyond these doors, ought to be marked and governed by that concern. All of our prayers and all of our praise should flow from a desire to see God's glory as it's displayed in His holiness. The psalmists understood this acutely, and there's much that we can learn from the psalmists this morning, especially as we look at Psalm 87 as we continue here in our psalm, summer psalm series, which we started on last week. Now, Psalm 87 falls into two categories. Old Testament theologians try to go throughout the Psalms and put them in certain pigeonholes, in certain categories where we can understand them a little better. And this particular Psalm falls into two of these categories. First, it's one of 11 Psalms or 12 Psalms, depending on whether you combine Psalms 42 and 43, as one who has in their superscription this phrase, which you'll see at the beginning of the Psalm, a psalm or a song of the song of the sons of Korah. This means that although we don't know who wrote this song, we do know who it was written for. It was written for the sons of Korah. Now, who were the sons of Korah? Well, the Old Testament tells us that they were a subgroup 
of the tribe of Levi who were especially committed to the praise of worship in temple through music. Second Chronicles chapter 20 verse 19 says, And the Levites of the children of the Kolathites and of the children of the Korhites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. While all of the psalms are really associated with worship, these songs, which are called the songs of the sons of Korah, are especially marked off to be used in public worship. There's something about these particular psalms that were so profound that the entire community was to use them in worship at the temple of Jerusalem, and they were to be sung by the songs of the sons of Korah. And this brings us to the second distinction of this particular psalm. This psalm is one of seven which are called the Psalms of Zion. They speak to the blessedness which is associated with dwelling in the city of God. So that is the double distinction that this particular psalm speaks of, and that's why I want to look at it this morning. It gives it the distinction in that this psalm encourages us to passionately, to persistently, to profoundly worship God by reflecting on the fact that God is the God of Zion. Now some of you are sitting there thinking, well, so what? Who cares that God is the God of Zion? What does that have to do with anything? God's the God of Cottage Hill, but we don't make a big to-do about that, do we? What does it even matter, or in that fact even mean that God is the God of of Zion. Well, let's look at the first three verses a little more closely here. The psalmist says, His foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God, Selah. The psalmist here in these three verses speaks of Jerusalem, but he doesn't use that word. Instead, he uses two other terms to refer to Jerusalem. He uses the term in verse 2, the gates of Zion, and then in verse 3, he refers to Jerusalem as the city of of God. Now here I have to give you a little bit of geography. I went over some of this when I did my slideshow, but that was after a big meal and many of you were groggy. So I'm going to go ahead and review some of this material again, not only so that you can remember it, but also so that you can see how this actually informs some of the things that we see in this particular passage of Scripture. When it says that his foundation is the holy mountains, it's talking about the situation, the geography of Jerusalem as it exists in the Middle East. Now, often the Bible speaks of Jerusalem as being a mountainous city. And in your mind's eye, when you think of a mountainous city, you usually think of a city sitting on the top of one high summit out there all by itself. But if you go to Jerusalem, you'll see that's not the case at all. It's not a city sitting on a summit all by itself with lowland all around the rest of it. As a matter of fact, it sits pretty much even along with the rest of the hills because it actually sits on a chain of mountains rather than one particular mountain. It sits on a high ridge, the backbone of what they call the Judean highlands. It's the place where most of Palestine ascends up to, but it's on one high ridge. And Jerusalem sits on one particular place on this ridge. And the reason that they chose that particular place on that ridge is because of its topography. It makes it unique and that it's very defendable. If you look upon along that ridge that runs up and down north and south throughout Israel, if you look to see where Jerusalem is, you'll notice that it's surrounded by deep valleys. To the east, you'll see a deep valley running from the north to the south. It's called the Kidron Valley. And then from the west, you'll see another valley called the Himen Valley coming out of the west, but then it sharply turns northward. So you see on three sides, all of Jerusalem sits on a mountaintop that's surrounded by deep canyons, which makes it easy to defend from uh, foreign enemies. But that's not what makes it so special. What makes it especially special, and I mentioned this in the slideshow, is between those two valleys that run north and south and east and west, there's another small valley that runs vertically, right up the middle. It's called the uh, Troithean Valley. And what's interesting, if you look from the air, you'll see that that makes a letter. 
No letter that we know of in the English language, but instead it makes a letter in the Hebrew language, the letter Shin, which kind of looks like a W that's smashed together and turned on its side. And this particular letter is the beginning letter of the word Shaddai, the word that represents God. If you've been into a Jewish home, you'll know they have their little mezuzah over the doorway when you go into that home. It has a little scroll of scripture, and every Jewish home will have one of these. And on that little mezuzah, there's a shin, an S, what we would translate, to represent the name of God. And so it is true in Jerusalem. The canyons that surround that city look like a shin, and it is where God's name dwells. It has the first letter of his name stamped upon it. Now, that may be simply a coincidence, but I don't think so. I think it has theological significance. As a matter of fact, so do the Old Testament writers. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 29, the writer says, Thine eyes, we pray, may be opened towards this house, towards this place, day and night, even of the place which thou hast said, my name shall be, do, shall be there. Thou mayest hearken unto thee in thy prayers which thy servant shall make towards this place. See, Jerusalem is a special place. Not necessarily because of its geography, not necessarily because of its typography, but simply because that is where God's name dwells. And why does God's name dwell there? Because that is where God's people dwell. That's where his temple is. That's where the sacrifices are offered. That's where his covenant is made with his people. That's what makes Zion significant in this passage, because his people, the people that he loves, lives there, and they are blessed forever. He says, The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Of all the places that Jacob wandered around in the wilderness through, none of those places are good as Zion, because that is the place that he designed for his people to dwell. That is where his name dwells. That is where his eyes are. That is where his heart is. That's the glorious thing that the psalmist says applies to Jerusalem. His people are there and he loves the people there. And you might say, well, okay, great for them. What about us? What does any of this have to do with us? Well, consider again verse 3. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God, city of God, Selah. Again, like I said at the beginning of this service, so many Christians are only concerned about what they can get out of God, what he can do for them. We need to, at times, put that aside and simply appreciate God for his own glory. And he says in verse 3, glorious things are spoken of this city. What is it that gets God the most glory? Now, there's a lot of literature that speculates on this point as to what most glorifies God. How does God get his greatest glory? And I won't wade into all that because the Bible actually doesn't specifically say what glorifies God most. So to say the wrong thing would actually be blasphemy. But we can say what glorifies God more than other things. And a matter of fact, that's what I read in our New Testament passage from first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He was talking about the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And he said, the New Covenant is far more glorious, exceedingly more glorious than the Old Covenant. We saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 10 and 11. Paul writes, For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away with was glorious, much more than that which remains is glorious. See, Paul in that passage contrasts the greater glory of the new covenant, the covenant that you and I have, as opposed to the lesser glory of the old covenant, the covenant of the Israelites. Now, the old covenant is gone. Here in this passage, it says, Glorious things are spoken of the city of God. But the city of God was laid waste. It's desolate. The temple is no longer there. Instead, an abomination sits on the temple mount. The people are gone. The king is gone. The sacrifices, the temple, all of it's gone. So what? Are we left without hope? Is there nothing that God glories in? Well, 
Not so at all. And Paul already told us. Instead, there was great glory in the Old Covenant, but there is even greater glory in the New. This is what we see in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. And the writer of Hebrews explains this in great detail of how and why the New Testament, the New Covenant, is more glorious than Zion of the Old Covenant. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 and following. The writer writes, For ye are not come unto the mountain that might be touched and that is burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of the trumpet, and the voice of the words which the voice they heard entreated that they should not be spoken to any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so, as much of as beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better than the blood of Abel. See, he says there are two covenants, and he contrasts these two covenants by using the metaphor of two mountains, Sinai, where Moses received the law, in Zion, where the temple dwelt. He said in the old covenant, it brought only law, it brought only fear, it brought only condemnation, it brought only death. But in the new covenant, it brought a savior, a sacrifice that could wipe out fear and instead give us confidence towards God. And in that sense, it is infinitely more glorious. Our Father has taken away our fear by the sacrifice of Christ and given us confidence in a new covenant that is far more glorious. Now, if the old covenant had that much glory in it, how much more does the new? Think about how he speaks of the glory of the old covenant back in Psalm 87, verses 4 through 6. He says, I will make mention of Rahab in Babylon to them that know me. Behold, Philista and Tyre with Ethiopia. This man was born there. And of Zion it shall be said, This and that man was born in her. And in the highest himself shall be established in her. The Lord shall count when he writeth up the people that this man was born there, Selah. What's God doing in these two verses? He's bragging a little bit, right? He's saying, Looky here. Look who was born in this city. Look who belongs to me. And the Bible says that that's a glorious thing. He's bragging on who belongs to him. Now, those of you who are parents in here probably think a lot of your children. And why do you think so much of them? Well, it's because they're the best kids on the planet, the best looking, the smartest, right? Well, that's a part of it, I'm sure. But really, it's because they're your kids. Ladies and gentlemen, when you fell in love, what was it that made you fall in love with your spouse to be? Was it because they were the fairest among 10,000s? Well, of course they are. But what really made you fall in love with them is that they were yours and you would be theirs. There was a special love that existed between you and them. And that's what God's doing here. He says there's a special love that exists between me and the people of Zion. And he wants to show that off a little bit to the nations that surround Zion. He says, look, here, and see who belongs to me. See how much I love them. See how dear they are to me. All of us in this room, I assume, are proud to be Americans. And we're proud because of all of America, because of all that America stands for. But what does that pride mean? Does that, is it a pride that we maintain because of who we are and what we did? Well, to an extent, but let me ask you, why were you born an American? Can you attribute that to your own pride? Of course not. It was simply providence. And we're very thankful for that fact as well. The Old Testament saints had to get their mind wrapped around this. So often, they would give up their idea of thankfulness, their idea of gratefulness, and trade it for a sense of pride. He says, And of Zion it shall be said, This and that man was born in her. Now, did any Jew choose to be born in Jerusalem? 
No, not at all. It wasn't something that they could be prideful in. Instead, it was something that they needed to be thankful for. You and I need to be thankful that we are Christians. You and I need to be thankful that we're marching to heavenly Zion. Not because of anything we did. God didn't look down upon you and say, yeah, he's got a lot to offer. I really could use him in my heavenly city. She, she's the whole package. I could really use her in my kingdom. No, it was because of his grace that he chose you. It's simply because of his love. There was nothing in you, nothing that he saw about you that he wanted, but simply because of his grace, you were reborn in the heavenly Zion. It's a truth that Paul tries to get through to us in Romans chapter 9, when he says, For the children of Jacob and Esau, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that purpose of God being according to election might stand, not of works, but instead of him that called. It was said unto her, The, el the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written of Jacob, I have loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith unto Moses, I will have mercy upon, I am, upon whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion upon whom I have compassion. Now we could stand here all day and argue the issues of election and foreknowledge and, pre, and predestination, but the simple truth is that you chose God freely because ultimately he chose you. Because he desired you to be his child. Not because of anything you've done. Not because of anything he even foresaw you to do. But instead, simply because and out of his grace. And it's interesting what he does here in verse 4 when he begins to brag on his people that they belong to him. He doesn't brag upon them generally, just to a general audience. But instead, he picks out their enemies. And he specifically shows to their enemies how much these particular people mean to him. Think about the list that he gives here. Rahab, Babylon, Philistia, Tyre, and Ethiopia. These were always the ancient enemies of the Jews, but instead he picks them out and says, Ha, 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 look who belongs to me. Look who has my special love bestowed upon them. Now we know where Babylon and Tyre and Ethiopia is, but where is Rahab? That's nowhere we know of in the Old Testament, right? It's not mentioned. What actually is, but not necessarily in connection with a place. Rahab was originally a poetical name associated with Egypt, Israel's oldest oppressor. And that name emphasized her arrogance, her violence, and her insolence. But over time, the term eventually evolved to refer to some kind of sea monster, oddly enough. We see this in Psalm 89, where the psalmist writes, O Lord, God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee, or thy faithfulness round about thee. Thou rulest the raging sea, and when the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces as one that is slain, and thou hast scattered thy enemies with thy strong arm. And then, after that, this term was continued to be developed, and not only to look, at some, look like some kind of sea monster, but specifically to refer to some kind of dragon. And in the Bible, we see that a dragon is associated with Satan. Isaiah 51, verse 9 says, Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as it in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Art thou not that hath cut Rahab up and wounded the dragon? That's why he refers to Rahab in this particular verse. It's a reference to the devil. And he shows to the devil those who are his in order so that he could display his glory in his plan of redemption. Do you realize that what God does for you? If that's what he did in the Old Testament, how much more does he do that for me and you today? You are a display of God's glory because he has redeemed you by his grace. It's out of nothing you've done, out of nothing you could even do, but instead he puts you on display as a subject of his glory. When's the last time that you thought of yourself 
that way. That God has redeemed you so that he can show his glory, not just to the world, but even to Satan in his great work of snatching you out of Satan's hand and placing you in his blessed kingdom. We have a glorious God who works in glorious ways. And it's only by his grace. And we should be thankful for that. There's not a day that goes by that you and I shouldn't take time to reflect on the fact that we are a trophy of his grace. A trophy of unmerited grace. A grace that picked you out of the foreigners and out of the Gentiles of the world and made you God's treasured protector. God treasured possession. You were hopeless in Satan's clutches. And he defeated Satan and he took you and made you one of his own. And now you stand as a testimony and a trophy of his mercy. Now what is our response to all this? We see that here finally in verse 7. Where the psalmist writes, As well as the singers and the players on instruments shall be there. All my springs are in thee. We see here that this is a psalm. A psalm that we are to respond to with praise and refreshment. There's little in the world today that we have to put our trust in. There's little good news out there to focus on. I appreciated the cartoon that was in this last week's Leader Vindicator where it showed flag after flag, it seems like week after week, our flags have been at half mass because it's tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. Ladies and gentlemen, that's how the world operates. That's how it already has operated. That's always how it, how it always will operate. If you put your trust in man, you'll be forever despondent, forever in despair. But when you put your trust in God, when you become a citizen of his heavenly Zion, everything changes. You have hope, you have refreshment, you have blessedness. There's two terms in here that we ought to look at here. It refers to those who play on instruments and then also God's springs being there in that city. When we see instruments in the Old Testament, it's usually associated in one way or another with the dwelling of the Holy Spirit in his people. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why you can know that you're blessed today. That's how you can glorify God, because you know that you have the Holy Spirit that's within you. That's how you know that God chose you, because he softened your heart. He took away your heart of stone and gave you a heart of flesh that could believe in him. And the second term he refers to are the springs that are in Jerusalem. Jerusalem has numerous springs throughout it, and I didn't get to do it when I was there last, but apparently you can go down now into Hezekiah's tunnel, where you can walk through the water tunnel, where the water's up to your waist, the whole way from one end to another. So if I ever go to Jerusalem again, that's my goal. But Jerusalem is filled with these tunnels. Like I think there are like three or four different uh, tunnel systems, where all this water wells up from these springs. And that's a blessedness. Ladies and gentlemen, we could use rain in our lands today. Not only physical rain, but especially spiritual rain. We need refreshment from God. And when you're a Christian, you tap into that fountain. You tap into those springs that well up to eternal life. Think about Jesus' interaction in John chapter 4. An interaction he had, not with a Jew, but someone that the Jews through their pride despised. A Samaritan. And this young lady, I don't know if she was young or not, but this lady comes to the well and she has nothing to draw water with. But Jesus tells her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be a well of water springing up unto eternal life. This is what God offers you and me. This is what glo is glorious about dwelling in his city. He has not only chosen you to be his. He has not only put you on display before all your enemies to show you as a trophy of his grace. But instead, he has made his spirit dwell in you. And from that, you can have a hope that springs eternal. There is no reason to despair or despond. You and I are marching to Zion. And rest assured, if God chose us, he will make sure 
that we will be successful in our journey. And we will arrive at those gates someday. And there we will glorify him forever with a perfect glory. Ladies and gentlemen, let's not wait until then. I encourage you every day, every week of your life, to concentrate on all that God has done for you. He has chosen you. You are a trophy of his special love. He loves you like he loves no one else. He sent his son to defeat Satan, to pay for your sins, and to make you his child. You're a citizen of the heavenly Zion, the city of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that it's written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, that whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Lord, we know that in and of ourselves we are nothing but guilty sinners, and we have a great deal to be ashamed of. But we thank you that you've chosen us. You've taken away our sins in our Savior, and you've given us your righteousness. You've given us a passport which allows us to enter into the holy city of Zion. You've made your Holy Spirit dwell within us, and from that we have a fountain of eternal life, dwelling, welling up within us and overflowing with all the joy and contentment and pleasure and privilege that we have in being children of God. Lord, we ask that you might help us to understand these truths. And as we concentrate, as we reflect upon them, we pray that they might change us. They might change us into the beings that we need to be so that we can glorify you better. Lord, thank you that we are a trophy of your grace. Lord, increase our faith, increase our understandings of these truths so that you can display your glory through us more and more, day by day. For it's the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Let's continue in worship.